coming up. It was a huge departure from one of rock's greatest bands. A hard rock song with a funky bass line and a disco beat, but it was a smash. It became their biggest selling song in America, but it's one that created controversy in urban legends over the years, mostly for its alleged hidden message in the song that when played backwards would share a secret. Stunning for sure. Song that was sung so fiercely by its lead singer, his throat bled. And the famous song title actually came from the year 1611. Coming up, the story of an 80s rock classic. You're going to love it. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to line your bedroom walls with posters of your favorite bands and your favorite artists, this is the channel for you. Make sure to subscribe below and click the bell so you always get our daily features, the stories of the greatest songs from the legends themselves. Also, check out more content at our page on Patreon. The link is below. You can become an insider and help us to keep the music alive. By the way, that uh, intro came from our viewer, Stephen R. Thank you. Now, Queen's biggest selling song of all time is, of course, Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, mama mia, mama mia. Mama mia, let me go. But their biggest selling physical single before digital music is actually another one by the Dust. Just under 2 million people uh, actually bought the physical copy in the early 80s. And uh, another 4 million people have paid for a digital download since then. The mastermind behind the song was the underappreciated basis for the band John Deacon, affectionately called Deaky by his bandmates. Uh, another One Bites the Dust is a furious assault of disjointed paranoia, highlighted by a sick riff. and Freddie Mercury's fiery histrionic vocal. John Deacon grew up with a fascination for rhythm and funk. Um, he recalled being drawn to soul music as a lad, and he dreamed of one day creating a song with a heavy dance groove that would attract black and white audiences alike. In 1978, Deacon was hanging out with the groove masters of American R&B, Nile Rodgers and Bernard Edwards. They were the driving forces of the band Chic. Chic had a, just a knack for crafting instantly seductive dance hits that thrived during the disco era and have influenced so many people since. They put out a string of nine consecutive tracks that lived in the top five on the U.S. Dance Club charts from 1977 through 1979. As the late Bernard Edwards, the incomparable basis for Chic when he recalled in an interview with the New Music Express that John Dinka was, uh, was kicking it in the studio with the band. And he was obsessed with their song, Good Times. The track's infectious riff was magic to Dinka's ears and it fired up his impulses to create a similar riff for his band, Queen. Uh, he came up with a simpler, less syncopated derivative of Good Times that he tweaked and he tweaked until he felt that it was ready to present to his bandmates in Queen. Let's go. Now, meanwhile, Sheik's good times captivated more than just John Deacon. Uh, it boogied its way all the way to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, that was in 1979. The good all the good times was uh, an undeniable smash as the song fell from the chart it marked the end of a fast and uh, furious cycle of success for the Edwards Rogers led Sheik. Uh, sadly, Bernard Edwards passed away in 1996 when he was only 43 years young. Uh, such a legend. Now, after the glory run of Sheik from 1972 to 1983, Nile Rogers became one of the most sought after producers and collaborators in all the music business. He's worked with superstars like David Bowie. Madonna, Duran Duran, Diana Ross, and Luther Vandross, just to name a few. Good Times was a progenitor for hip hop. It was the heavily sampled riff for the instrumental track of the Sugar Hill Gang's rapper's delight, arguably the song that brought the hip hop sound to a mass audience. Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. 
Rapper's Delight was released a month after Good Times peaked at number one on the US pop chart. Now, Queen was not sued for copyright infringement for another one bites the dust, but Edwards and Rogers did sue the Sugar Hill Gang, and uh, they were awarded a settlement by the court that included the duo sharing songwriting credits on Rapper's Delight. <laughs> What you gonna do today? John Deacon went into his private studio at that time and he laid down his pet dance project with a big boss groove and a persistent phrase that rolled along with the tempo of the track. Another one bites the dust. So let's talk about that for a second. The first documented paraphrase of the expression, another one bites the dust, it actually comes from the 1611 King James Bible. In Psalms chapter 72, verse 9, the scripture reads, They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. Now, the phrase bite the dust was first used in Tobias Smollett's uh, 1748 translation of the adventures of Gil Blas de Santillana, uh, which says, We made the two of them bite the dust and the others prepare themselves to fight. Another one bites the dust was recognized in the late period of the Western outlaw days of the early 1900s with the utterance referring to uh, gunslingers and cowboys who had fallen from gunfire. It was first defined as an idiom in the 2004 Urban Dictionary. Now when Deakey presented the music track for Another One Bites the Dust uh, to his partners in Queen, the track was met with uh, mostly fear and loathing. Fear because the music was not rock, it was blatantly disco and entering dangerous territory for core Queen fans. Uh, the loathing came from Queen co-founder and revered drummer Roger Taylor. Uh, Roger was adamantly against the song from the get-go and he thought the song would be tossed away for good. But it was Freddie Mercury that enthusiastically crusaded for the band to record the song as a cut on their 1980 album, The Game. Freddie fought for the song, and uh, when Roger expressed his disgust you know, for the way that the sessions were going for the song in the studio, Freddie told Roger basically to back off. He said, and I quote, Darling, leave it to me. I believe in this. End of quote. Uh, that's what Brian May remembers. Brian candidly imparted that Another One Bites the Dust would not have been recorded if Freddie hadn't uh, been a big champion and pushed it through all the way. Now, like Deakey, Freddie wanted Queen to, to make a song that would be big in the dance clubs. Freddie frequented the disco scene and understood it. Uh, the band was also strongly encouraged to put out a dance track by the king of pop himself, Michael Jackson. MJ, big fan of Queen's music, and he told Freddie and the guys several times, you know, to make a song that the cats can dance to. The phrase Another One Bites the Dust, it rang a bell for John Deacon to use as a song title. Uh, from reading the story of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929, actually. It's about two rival gangs in Prohibition period Chicago. One gang led by George Bugs Moran and the other by the infamous Al Capone. Uh, Al Capone ordered a hit on Moran, but the contract killer missed Moran because he was late arriving to his post. Six of Moran's henchmen were caught by Capone's hitmen and were shot dead inside a bootleg whiskey shop and fled the crime scene. Uh, that explains the reference to, you know, machine guns ready to go and out of the door of the bullets rip. With the shots matching the sound of the beat. The lyrical structure of Another One Bites the Dust is uh, not cohesive unless you break it down in three acts. You know, act one, uh, it's a cold-blooded mobster attack, like a shoot 'em up gangster movie with machine guns hanging on the edge of your seat and the sound of the bullets ripping out of the doorway. Act two, that's about a jilted lover that strikes back at his cold-hearted ex-lover and who has taken him for everything that he had. Once again, the bullets rip out of a doorway to the sound of the beat. 
And the climactic third act, number three, is a Freddie Mercury motivational sermon where he rises up against anyone that tries to bring him to the ground and says, bring it on. I'm ready. Yes, I'm ready for you. I'm standing on my own two feet. The bullets of self-defense and defiance rip out of the doorway yet again with a warning for the narrator's detractors in the final chorus. Hey, I'm gonna get you two, another one bites the dust. Shootout. Now, one of the many traits that makes Freddie Mercury such an incredible, incomparable, fantastic, perfect vocalist is that he always wanted to make a grandiose statement with the music of Queen, but he seemed to want to do something extra special with his performance on Another One Bites the Dust. Deacon, you know, not known as a singer, he tried to really hard to demonstrate to Freddie how he imagined that the song should be sung. Freddie, of course, instinctively picked up what Deacon was trying to convey perfectly. He sensed that uh, Another One Bites the Dust had the potential to be an enormous hit, and he just attacked the vocal with so much vigor giving it everything that he had. Brian May recounted that Freddie went into the vocal booth and he sang the vocal over and over and over, uh, trying to get it down perfectly until his throat actually started to bleed from putting too much strain on his vocal cords. He just loved his craft. He was committed to it. In addition to writing the lyrics and the music for Another One Bites the Dust, Deke played all the instruments on the studio track. He played the bass, piano, electric guitar, and the hand claps. Uh, the Roger Taylor drum line was recorded in loops. Uh, remember, this was before the outbreak of drum machines, so producers and artists had to be very crafty in the studio to get a specific sound. Looping and overdubbing you know, was still a big part of the recording process. So Brian May contributed guitar flourishes with his Eventide harmonizer. There are no synths on this recording. All the effects that you hear are created by piano, electric guitars, and drums. The sound effects were run through the harmonizer for additional processing. Uh, the harmonizer produced the, the swirling nature of the song that's so prevalent in the bridge. Now, the game was released as uh, Queen's eighth studio album in the summer of 1980. The lead single from the record was the Elvis-like rockabilly ditty, a crazy little thing called Love. And that was the band's first number one smash on the Billboard Hot 100. Ooh, crazy, little crazy little thing called Love, uh, that was followed by Save Me. It was the second single from the game. And although it climbed to number 11 in the UK and it was a top 10 single in several other countries, it failed to chart in the US. Now the third single, Play the Game, came out next and it uh, narrowly missed the top 40. It stalled at number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100. It peaked at number 14 in the UK. Play the, game of love. the game kicked off uh, with a bang, but after two singles stiffed following Crazy Little Thing Called Love, the album appeared to, you know, have run its course. This was before they released uh, six or seven singles like they did in the mid 80s with a lot of albums. Uh, they were trying to figure out if they were gonna do a fourth single from the game. One of Queen's main roadies was very vocal that the band should release another one bites the dust. Apparently, despite lugging around the band's heavy gear from gig to gig, the roadie didn't carry a lot of weight in the band's decisions and you know, the guys in Queen kind of laughed off his opinion. Uh, the band regarded Another One Bites the Dust, uh, I guess, as a, just a catchy dance track, nothing more. It wasn't until Michael Jackson encouraged them to put the song out as a single that they were actually convinced that they should. Uh, Michael Jackson attended the Queen concert, to, I believe it was in LA, and he went backstage to see the band after the performance. And he was very animated about how much he loved Another One Bites the Dust. MJ told the foursome that the song would absolutely top the chart. So the band listened to MJ and uh, Another One Bites the Dust became the fourth single from the game. Now, Michael Jackson's prophecy that the song would be a huge hit, it came true. And another one gone, and another one gone, another one bites the dust, hey. 
Another one bites the dust shot to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in the fall of 1980. And it stayed there for three weeks. It was also uh, the longest running top 10 single on the Billboard charts for that entire year. Again, Jay knew what he was talking about. This was between Off the Wall and Thriller. The giant popularity of the song dramatically juiced record sales that led the game to selling over 4 million units as an album. It was Queen's only LP to reach number one on the album charts in the US, actually. Now, another one by Sedus also went to number two on the Hot Soul Singles chart. It was the only Queen song that got that kind of heat from the black community in America. In fact, many fans and journalists were convinced that the lead vocal on Another One Bites the Dust was belted out by a black man. Uh, the people that were under that impression had obviously not heard the power of Freddie Mercury's voice prior to listening to Another One Bites the Dust, that's for sure. Uh, Freddie's voice took this song in my opinion, to another dimension entirely with a blazing vocal flow that just rips through your ears and leaves you in utter disbelief. The track rose to number two on the Hot Disco Singles Chart as well. It was the number one sensation in Spain and Canada, Israel. Uh, went to number two in New Zealand, number five in Australia, and number seven in the UK. Another one by Sedas has sold almost 6 million copies in the States alone and over 9 million worldwide. Uh, that's physical and digital. Another one by Sedas won the American Music Award for Favorite Rock Single in 1981. It was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Rock Performance by a duo or group with vocal. It was also in 81, but they lost to Bob Seger in the Silver Bullet Band's performance of uh, Against the Wind. In the tradition of We Will Rock You and We Are the Champions. Another One Bites the Dust has become an arena rock staple in sporting events around the globe for every sport. The song's fiery resilience attracted Sylvester Stallone. He actually wanted to incorporate it into his Rocky movie franchise, but they wouldn't give permission. Actually, many out there aren't aware. Another One Bites the Dust was Sly's first choice to be the theme song for Rocky III at the first when they do that big montage, but it was ultimately replaced in favor of Eye of the Tiger. Another One Bites the Dust was definitely a big influence on Eye of the Tiger, as co-writer Jim Peterick related to me in an interview. You can see that on our Bevo channel. And for every 80s kid, we remember that Another One Bites the Dust was a professional wrestler Junkyard Dog's theme song when he'd enter the ring. I'll never forget when he was dancing with those kids after he won that one time. <laughs> I used to do the same dance when my dad played the record when I was about five years old. I mean, this song is just so funky, you can't help it. Now, the track's involuntary musical imagery, which is the scientific term explaining why this song is impossible to get out of your head. It had a resurgence with the uh, new generation after the Queen biopic Bohemian Rhapsody actually re-entered the music charts, uh, including a number four ranking in the hot and rock and alternative billboard chart that was in 2019. The sound of the beat. I'll do it. Another one that all of us 80s kids, uh, most of us probably remember, is when John Deacon's uh, irresistibly funky super hit was under the microscope and targeted by Christian evangelists for alleged backmasking. Uh, the ultra-religious committee claimed that if you play the chorus of Another One Bites the Dust backwards, there is a subliminal uh, drug message where you can hear Freddie, uh, his voice say it's Fun to smoke marijuana. <laughs> Spokesman for Queen's current label, Hollywood Records, denied that the song carries such a message. I mean, one could make the argument that these uh, imaginary messages uh, were sometimes conjured up by some of these evangelists. Maybe that's what they did in their spare time. I don't know. One more positive note. Another one by Sedus was used as the soundtrack for a study to train medical professionals to administer the correct number of chest compressions per minute while performing CPR. During the study, 
Uh, they played the song for the participants to sync with the rhythm of the song to generate the necessary number of compressions. And the bass line of Another One Bites the Dust, uh, that's uh, 110 beats per minute, which is right in the sweet spot for the prescribed uh, 100 to 120 uh, chest compressions as recommended by the British Heart Foundation. So Another One Bites the Dust, uh, has literally saved lives. The evangelist would be happy to know that. In addition to his stellar bass playing, John Deacon manifested his valuable utility to Queen as a songwriter, arranger, and instrumentalist, most prolifically on Another One Bites the Dust. We also need to appreciate his invaluable contribution on several other greatest hits by Queen. A lot of people don't realize this. But John Deacon wrote You're My Best Friend, uh, it's a song that he dedicated to his wife from A Night at the Opera. That was a number seven hit in the UK and number nine here in America. Oh, Deacon John, as he sometimes calls himself, also wrote the number three UK smash, I Want to Break Free, from the Works LP in 1984, one of my favorite Queen songs. And as you'll recall, in a feature we did some months back on P.O.R., Deke came up with another ridiculously infectious riff that was the genesis for Under Pressure, Queen's uh, double platinum collaboration with the great David Bowie. Under pressure. John Deacon, you know, he's never one to hog the spotlight. He rarely spoke in rehearsals and he avoided confrontations. He just went about his business as the quiet and the steadiest member of Queen's glory years. Deacon has been retired from the music business for many years. He's enjoying time with his family from his home in Southwest London. Just a true master of music. We salute you, Mr. John Deacon. Leave us a comment about this funky rock and disco classic. What are your thoughts on the performances by Freddie Mercury and John Deacon? What are your memories of this song and this incredible band. What other songs should we break down from Queen? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, we do invite you to subscribe below. Click the bell so you never miss out on our daily content. And take a look at our other content on Patreon. I think you'll enjoy it. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. See you soon.